everybody for being here. I'm honored to introduce you Mr. Kirill Petkov. He is the newest, perhaps, uh, the youngest, perhaps, the newest, surely, but the youngest, perhaps, Prime Minister of the European Union. And uh, I'm very honored to introduce him to you because he's a newcomer also in politics. How many months you are in politics? So just over 100 days. <laughs> so yeah. it's not much. So uh, the Prime Minister will, uh, will make a statement for around 10 minutes. So, and after that, I have the, the pleasure to ask him two or three questions, to uh, perhaps to uh, explain some things of his statement. So we are hearing you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. So I want to open up a discussion that maybe we all know, but we haven't discussed too much about. Uh, the war in Ukraine opened this topic even to a higher level. The question is, why after all these years, we have been still so dependent on Russian energy? Why have we allowed, um, as Europeans, um, somehow to close our eyes on this dependency, as though we never expected this to happen, even though Crimea happened, Crimea happened a few, a few years ago? And I looked at the answer to my own country. We are one of the more dependent countries on Russia, on Russian gas, on Russian oil, and nuclear fuel. Why didn't we diversify? So in this, in this speech, I, I want to tell you a, a little story about two projects. One project is what is called the Turkish Stream. This is a project, a gas project, that goes through Turkey, through Bulgaria, Serbia, all the way to Hungary. The idea of this uh, Russian stream was uh, to bypass the dependency of Russia on Ukraine. And it was a geopolitically important project for them. For Bulgaria, though, this project costed 1.5 billion euros to pass the pipe through Bulgaria, Bulgarian territory. And surprisingly for us, as a new government, we realized that while we get some transit taxes, we have not even access to the gas. So why would the government spend 1.5 billion euros on a pipe that doesn't even bring you gas, and in any way does not give you um, any um, diversification? A second project, on the other hand, costs only 240 million euros, so a fraction of the cost. Um, the cost per kilometer is half. It's from Greece to Bulgaria. It allows for diversification of Russian gas, as we can buy LNG and Azeri gas. And between these two projects, how did our previous government, for example, prioritize? We built the first project for one and a half billion that doesn't even give us access to gas for three years. While we have not built the second project that gives us real diversification for 240 million for over 10 years, and it's still not completed. It will be completed in June. This is my promise to, uh, to the Bulgarian people and, and to the Greek people, yeah. And here I want to open, at the same time, I also hear that part of our dependency on gas uh, prices and energy prices in Europe is because so much of the gas storages throughout Europe and so many of the energy projects throughout Europe are actually owned by Gazprom. How did we allow for this to happen? And looking at uh, my own country, I want to bring the topic of national corruption versus and corruption as a foreign policy instrument of Russia. Have we not really openly discussed the topic, how these projects really happened? In my case, I had a very concrete view of it. I recently arrested uh, the, the previous prime minister uh, because of local, local corruption scheme. But to my surprise, his communication director, when we went for the arrest, had brand new Range Rovers that was given for free by the same construction company that did the Turkish stream. So if we look at the corruption issue as a local, national issue, and we close our eyes to that, 
we actually do not see maybe one of the strongest foreign policy instruments of Russia throughout Europe. And I want to open this discussion today on this topic because we have to do a lot in order to change that. We should not be in another 10 years in the same situation as we are today. This dependency on Russian energy, we should try to look in, in, into our own political systems. How was this allowed to be done? And was there corruption involved in the process? Also, when we talk about such a regional and European and worldwide corruption strategies, we cannot combat it as individual member states too. Each one has to do their own part, but we also have to work together. One good example of such instrument is, for example, in the US is Magnitsky. Magnitsky is a global act for anybody who is involved in corruption, doesn't need to be involved with US interest. I've already spoken to the European Commission on the issue that maybe the European Public Prosecutor's Office should increase their mandate. We should have a mandate that doesn't cover only EU funds. We should cover potentially cross-border money laundering. We should cover terrorism. We should cover high level of corruption, especially when more than one state is involved. We should also think about uh, other transparent mechanisms for this not to be allowed again. And if we want to really make sure that no rogue regime in the future has influence on our national policies, on our national uh, dependencies on foreign suppliers, we should really start discussing this topic on national, regional, European, and global level. And I would leave you with the final point here, and this is for, for the Europeans in the room. Even when we talk about political families in Europe, we really should start thinking if we have a high degree of no tolerance to corruption on a European level, and we have high degree of anti-discrimination rules, and we have all these uh, high values on a European level. At the same time, many of the political families have member states and parties within these, uh, these political families that are not abiding to these principles. We really have to start, start saying we should not close our eyes to this. We should, we should not allow individual member states, just because they potentially can give us support in Brussels or somebody somewhere else, to say, OK, this is national issue. We should not look at it. But because when you combine all the national issues, and all the eyes that we have closed throughout these years, now we're faced with the current situation where it's such a high dependency on a regime that none of us want to be dependent from, we're in. So with this, I want to open up the floor and really start thinking all of us together about limiting national corruption within the framework of uh, decreasing foreign interference in our own economies and countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Well, αν μπορούσα να συγκρατήσω κάτι από την, τα, την παρέμβασή του, θα ήταν η σαφέστερη ε, διατύπωση που έχω ακούσει ποτέ από ε, senior politician that corruption is a, in the base of Russian policy. And, uh, and that we should, all together, the European Union, care about this and make something. So, what can we do about this? Because the people who have to act is the same people who, in, in, the, in many cases, are the objects of the corruption that we want to fight against. So, what's your opinion about that? So, always to fight corruption, the first element is transparency shining light on topics. Because in order to have corruption, you have to have a little secret. And nobody wants to talk about little secrets. So as we bring the topic forward to this type of events, as we bring the topic forward on the European Council level, 
uh, this is the first step that we have to, first we have to acknowledge the problem, then try to look for the solution. At the same time, we already have institutions that are working. I mean, it's clear for me that Mrs. Kyuveshi, for example, is a great person to be involved with the European Public Prosecutor's Office to increase her mandate. It should not be limited to EU funds. For example, most of those corrupt schemes, they involve money laundering. Once you do the corruption, you have to transfer the funds somewhere else. First practical step is I would advocate for the European Public Prosecutor's Office to have mandate over cross-border money laundering. Clear, easy, it's not too hard to accept. Yes, we give a little bit of a potential sovereignty again, because this is issue that's currently covered by the local prosecutors. But at this point in time, at this stage of the game, I think the, the gap is clearly observed. So this is one step. So that's about corruption. Let's talk about the second part, Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that we have a war, and the war is here to stay. I don't think that it will finish up tomorrow or after tomorrow or in uh, one week. At any way, the consequences of the war will remain long after that. Uh, what's your opinion? How, how you comment the war problem now that we have in, in Europe and in the world? I mean, this war is a result of being stuck between two worlds. The world of the 19th century, where Europe was drawn on a napkin, and areas of influence were identified, and the world of today, where each country has the, their own choice to make and to determine their own destiny. So really, in the end of the day, it's, it's a fight between autocracy, old historical understanding of how the world works, and democracy and uh, the right for each country to choose their destiny. So we have to stand firm. We showed unity. We have to show smart strategies. I mean, our economic measures were effective to, to a big degree, but we should think about asymmetric measures that are the most effective. These are the ones that are making pressure on the Russian regime but are not influencing as much the, the, our economies. For example, freezing the, the central bank reserve was such an asymmetric measure. Uh, so we have to be smart about this. I hope uh, we, we continue to be strong and being together because unity was a big, big uh, deal. The fact that the European Commission yesterday came to Bucha and showed that we're not close, closing our eyes to war atrocities. And, uh, in the end of the day, democracy should prevail. And I think, uh, unfortunately, many lives are being lost today. But uh, I don't think the end game could be any different than uh, the success of the Ukrainians to show that they can control their own destiny. But it seems to me that Europe has a very particular position that we don't want to fight that war, but we want to win that war. I don't think it's very easy to do it. but. Now is Ukraine fighting for, all, for everybody, Russia is fighting for Russia, and we are talking about sanctions, about uh, costs, about uh, natural gas or energy supplies and everything. How can we win a war if we don't fight it? That, that, because this conflict is there to stay, we have to move extremely fast on decreasing our dependence. Because it's clear to most governments, unfortunately that's the reality, that if we completely cut out, in this very moment, everything, Russian oil, Russian gas, zero uh, dependency overnight, there will be a big backlash to our economic results. But as I told you, our diversification should happen by June. Not in two years, not in three years, by June. Each, each of us can try to work on the dependencies as fast as possible. Our response could increase in strength and in bravery because when we don't have the, the economic backlash in our local countries, we have the chance to, to stay stronger. Uh, I think we all understand the dependencies on the Russian Federation on exports on oil and gas. So I think the next response level that we have to do is do as fast, the fastest possible this diversification so that the big cash flow income that comes today can be stopped in the future if they continue with, with the war. 
And you think that we can, we can fix it until June? Bulgaria, Bulgaria I'm speaking to my yeah, country. Okay. Bulgaria can fix a big part of this problem by June. Now, the third partner in the problem had corruption, Russia, the war, European Union. Mm -hmm. You think that uh, we should have a general, uh, how to say, a, a strong, uh, decisive position against Russia, or we, we modulate the attitude of the European Union towards Russia? No, at this point, we cannot be weak. Uh, we did, I mean, with this type of international bully, you cannot show weakness, you cannot show softness. I mean, it, it would be, after what we saw in Bucha, after what we saw the war crimes, we have to be very strong, but we have to be strong together. And we should not rely on one member state to take over the, the lead. Uh, we should talk as much as we have to talk amongst each other, but our position has to be common and it has to be strong. Uh, and I think even today, even before cutting out, for example, all the Russian gas into the EU. We should immediately, immediately speak in one voice that this is the biggest market of the world. If we cannot even exercise the market pressure on purchasing this, this gas and say anybody who wants to deal with any member state in Europe has to deal with through this negotiating team in the European Commission, that should be a, a really fast step to show that uh, Russia cannot try to play the different member states to get kind of a softness into our foreign policy. And this depends on us. This depends on leadership on each member state and leadership together when we sit around the round table. And the last question, I think it's the, the last one. How do you perceive the procedure of negotiation with the Western Balkans, North Macedonia, Albania? Do you think that we should move on or we should uh, freeze it for, for now? We have to move on as fast as possible. Uh, we see the risk of, we see the risk of uh, instability in the Western Balkans as a potential another part of Russia's foreign policy. I just, uh, last week, uh, we found two of Russia cooperatives working in my intelligence services, specifically on Western Balkans. I know that North Macedonia kicked out five Russian spies last week as well. Uh, so uh, obviously, Russia has a play into instability in the Western Balkans. And the faster we move on or, this. Or in North Macedonia, or perhaps also Albania. I'm and sure throughout the region. The I, I'm speaking about the yeah. ones that I'm most familiar with. Uh, and again, this is a driving force. How this foreign influence works is through corruption. The same people that wake up in the morning and think, should I steal from the state? I think, should I cooperate with a rogue state, even though it's not in my country's best interest, to self-benefit? This is, this is a theme that should get through all of us. And the US, and Magnitsky, by the way, uh, has been applied a bit out even for any of the US uh, uh, audience here. I would actually ask for even further and more aggressive use on this tool, especially in our region, in order to prevent this type of mandling into the interior uh, strategies and the stability of the Western Balkans. At the same time, we as individual countries in the Balkans have a leadership role to play. And uh, while there has been not such a great history in the past from between many of those country relationships, now it's time to come together and show that the Balkans uh, means coordination, not discoordination. So, thank you, Prime Minister. It's very interesting.